glad you're all here. So good evening. Welcome to tonight's third Sunday conversation here at Hope City Church. I'm so happy you're here. I think I know everybody, but my name's Chris Jackson, and I'm super excited to facilitate. I, I, I'm really liking these third Sunday conversations, and I hope they're helpful. And based on the topic, I know we'll draw different groups of people based on what we're discussing. Um, but tonight we're doing what we're calling a communication masterclass, and I, I, just, I guess we're not supposed to say masterclass. I guess that's actually a technical trademarked thing, but I feel like everybody's saying masterclass about everything, so I thought we could jump onto that <laughs> bandwagon. But whether we can call it that or not, we, we're going to have some incredible information shared tonight on the subject of communication. And I know we've got married couples here, we have single people, we have engaged people. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what where, where, what your relationship status is in terms of um, how many relationships or romantic relationships or not, it, this is a human discussion. If you are a human and you interact with other humans, then we need to know how to communicate well. Communication is one of those areas where it, it, can, it can help you navigate the most delicate, difficult situations, or it can just blow up and you can get stuck. So this is gonna be really good. It's gonna be really, really helpful. Um, if you've been to these before, uh, the typical format is we'll start with a little bit of a testimony. I'm not going to do a testimony tonight. I'm going to show you a video. We're going to let Ray Romano give us the testimony for how to communicate brilliantly. Um, but then uh, we'll usually interview kind of a expert is the wrong word, but somebody with some experience, some, some skill in the area. Um, it will either be Carol that I'll be interacting with or she and I will interact with these experts together. And uh, I shared with you last month that Carol Montgomery uh, will be partnering with me in hosting all of our third Sunday events. And Jessica and I felt like it was, <laughs> we felt like it was Christmas morning when Carol agreed to help us with this truly. So thank you. She's actually also going to be helping me speak on Mother's Day um, in our, uh, at Hope. So it's going to be really special. Um, if you don't know Carol, uh, and some of you know her through church, some of you might not know her at church, but you know her professionally through her role as a marriage and family therapist. If you don't know her, you'll know her after tonight. She's, she's um, very gifted, very winsome, so good at taking tough concepts and just explaining them in a, in a clear and a compelling way. And it's a huge gift to have you with us. I love you, and we all love you so much. How about we start with um, some words of wisdom from Ray, Ray Romano. So if you've ruled out any medical problem and your child is still wetting the bed, he may be trying to tell you something. He's telling you I have to pee. <laughs> so I think we're going to wrap it up for tonight. But before we do, are there any other questions? Yes, uh, Deborah. Yeah. Um, we have a six-year-old daughter, and she's a great kid, but she's been having trouble listening, and she's been very stubborn lately. But that's every kid. It's not. It's just a phase, right? Well, this is a perfect opportunity for you to try some active listening. Thank you. We'll try that. Wait a second. Wait. So active listening? I'm not familiar with that. Well, it's encouraging your child to express herself verbally without influencing her with your own preconceived notions or opinions. Got it. Here we go. <laughs> well, um, why don't we try to illustrate this with a little role playing? Let's have you. Ray, is it? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. Ray, why don't you come to the front of the class? Why don't you go? No, go. Right. Why don't you go, Deb? Fine. Don't be shy. Now, Ray, let's just say that I'm your daughter and um, I refuse to, to go to visit Grandma on her birthday. Well, in this case, I happen to know Grandma and I can't say I blame you. <laughs> Just hypothetically, Ray, yeah. all right? Now, let's just say, Ray, that you want to get from your daughter what she's really feeling. Go ahead. Do it. Okay. Daughter. <laughs> you have to go to Grandma's house. I'm not going. <laughs> uh, well, you have to go. It's her birthday. I hate when you make me do things. <laughs> Look, I'm not making you go, okay? It's Grandma's birthday. There aren't going to be many more of them. Oh. Mm. <laughs> now, see, I'm going to stop you just for a second, Ray. Um, you see, 
I don't think at this point we need to discuss Grandma's mortality. Oh. <laughs> Doing, Ray? Don't... I'm playing the game. It's not a game. It's okay. It's okay. Ray, if I say to you, I hate when you make me do things, perhaps you could acknowledge my feelings by saying something like, you feel you don't have any control over our plans. You understand? That doesn't sound like something I would say. It just takes a little practice. Come on, let's keep going. Yeah, let's, let's. let's. All my friends are going to the park, but I have to go to some boring party? Uh, you think that the party's gonna be boring? That's it, Ray. See, you're reflecting her feelings back. Thanks. Yes! It's just a bunch of grown-ups sitting around an old house. I want to be with my friends. But Grandma has that big bowl of coffee nips. <laughs> I don't care. And you can't make me. What are you doing? I'm not going. Well, yeah, please, get up. You get up. Why do I have to go? Well, I don't know. But why? Well, because I said so. Huh? <laughs> That was big when I was a kid. All right, look, Mommy said you gotta go. Leave Mommy out of it, Ray. Thank you. Right, look, you better get up or... Or what? Or no more TV. No, Ray. Okay, or you're going to boarding school. Do you always threaten? No. No, sometimes she yells. Oh, Ray. I I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Thank you all for coming. I'll see you next week. Ray and Deborah, I'd like you to stay after class, please. I think we need to talk. So we're not following a script tonight in the sense that we're not trying to cover a certain amount of content. Um, I'm going to just ask some questions. So, the, so in terms of how to receive tonight, um, my encouragement would be just, just you're, you're going to hear a whole smattering of thoughts and wisdoms and perspectives. And in a sense, this is like free therapy, but, but you're going to, but, but just, just kind of latch on to what you need. So um, if certain threads aren't exactly where you are, just hang in there because we'll keep going and, and we'll eventually get to, we'll talk about things like, you know, dealing with passive aggression and uh, manipulation and how do you confront and uh, we'll, we'll get into some good helpful things. So before we get into that though, my dear friend, do you want to get the bragging out of the way regarding the Super Bowl? Oh, yeah, who won? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I was, on, on that note, the fights and, um, and the Montgomerys and, and Jessica and uh, Isaiah, we all came up to the front because you had mentioned something, there'd be prayer support last week, I think. Okay, Did you say okay. that? Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't there. So. Yeah. Why? Why? Are you, I, just, we won't. We won't bog down on this. Why are you a Kansas City Chiefs fan? Like, why live in California and be a fan of Kansas well, City? Well, Neil was born in Kansas, oh. so I am married into the Chiefs kingdom. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I do have one serious question for you. It's not. It's not in the communication specifically, but we had lunch right after church today with one of your really closest friends, and she, Candy, was saying that. She described you as being um, incredibly grace-filled. And if you've done counseling with Carol or you've interacted with her, you've seen that. And I was just curious, how did you become that way? Because I know as a, as a therapist, you can't sit in judgment over your, your, your clients. I mean, you can't sit there and judge them. You have to hear some difficult things, and you have to be able to still love them. Is that, is that personality? Is that learned? Because I want to be more like that. Thank you. And thank you, Candy. <laughs> um, well, I wouldn't have described myself that way, so thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I think what the, in that context, you may be saying I'm not judgmental. Um, mm. Maybe that's what it is. Um, I am not. I have always really appreciated safe places where you can fully be yourself, and so I've always wanted to be that. And I think I make you uncomfortable every time I say this, but I regularly confess my sins. That's just a spiritual practice that is very cleansing for me. And then I experience the grace that comes from that. But it's very humbling. So as I confess my sins, why am I going to judge anyone for theirs is, mm. is kind of the way I've, I see that. So I don't know. So that might be part of it. That's good. Because you have strong convictions about things. Mm hmm yeah. I do. So being non-judgmental doesn't mean that you don't have high standards or strong convictions about things, but, but, but not everybody can do that and actually be truly unconditionally loving even when you strongly disagree, which is probably where a lot of communication yeah. starts breaking down. But. but I can also be really direct. 
So if I, if I see something that someone's maybe being arrogant about or mm -hmm. not owning up to, I will directly call that out. Just try and do it nicely. <laughs> do you have any clients that you just can't stand? <laughs> Luckily, no. Mm -hmm. So let's, so moving to the communication, what's just, let's just start with super big picture. Can you just describe it, what does an amazing communicator look like? And then the contrast that with what's poor communication. Okay. Um, if I were to summarize that really quickly, I would say that a really good communicator is more often than not communicating in a way that's very constructive and productive. And it, biblically speaking, very uplifting. You walk away, even though you may not agree, you feel respected and, um, and, and self-respect. Um, in poor communication, it tends to be destructive and it tears down. So I think that's how I would summarize that. It's, it just doesn't go anywhere. And we see it all the time. <laughs> we see it in politics. We see it everywhere. It's just not productive. It's destructive. So before we even get into any of the specifics or the nuance, just kind of rephrase that. Because if, if we walked into every single conversation with the idea I am going to be productive and helpful. That mindset alone would be a game changer. Yeah. And that's my challenge. That's my personal challenge to myself. It's my challenge for you that we're kind enough to come back to church on a Sunday afternoon is decide who you want to be. Um, I want to show up as a person that communicates respectfully and has self-respect. So I want to be constructive and productive. And when you're angry or some of those are nervous, those emotions can really take that away, but for the most part, I, I just really want you to, if you take away nothing, I really want you to think about who do I want to be in my, next, in my next communication? How do I want to show up? And I think that's such an important part of our faith, our transformation in our faith. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually pretty deep because, I mean, Jesus said out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, mm -hmm. and what comes out of us is a reflection of what's in us. And I've, I've never heard a communication talk started that way, yeah. where communication is not about, you know, say what you mean, mean what you say, don't say it mean. It's all of that's helpful, but it's about who do you want to be in this conversation? Am I mean? Am I manipulative? Am I combative? Or am I loving and serving? And right. am I going to lift the people around me? Yeah. The Bible says that it's easy to be nice to nice people. <laughs> Everyone does that. All humans are nice to nice people, more or less. But it's harder to be nice to people that aren't nice and are difficult. And so, again, we have the rubber meat in the road there, the, the sheep and the goat, in a way that who do you want to be? Yeah. So I know these are obvious. The next couple questions are super obvious. But just, just comment on them anyway, if you don't mind. In your practice, mm -hmm. Communication, that's pretty high on the list of breakdowns. Mm -hmm. So as a marriage and family therapist, mm -hmm. is that in the top three, top one? It, it absolutely is, again, because it can destroy or build um, a relationship pretty quickly. And the littlest, subtlest things, that's one of the things I can be very direct about. And um, I'm happy to be because um, I, I, and I say respect all the time. I, I should... I should have rights to that song. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> um, I feel so strongly about that because out of respect comes healthy communication, and, and it is. So those are some real, real hallmarks, trust and safety, and all those good things come out of good communication. So it's hugely important. Hmm. So Vladimir Putin was just interviewed by, was it Tucker Carlson? And he, he came off wonderfully. He communicated wonderfully, very clear, very eloquent, quoted history, almost poetically. So you, you can be a good speaker, and, and that doesn't necessarily always reflect what's going on the inside, because he certainly painted things in a certain way in that conversation that are different than what's happening in Ukraine. And, um, um, and I don't know what people's thoughts and opinions are on how much we should or shouldn't back Ukraine. but. But it, it was very fascinating that being eloquent um, is not the same thing as what you're describing of being a true, like you're, you're, you're tethering communication to who we are in our character. Right. So that example is possibly, I don't know the motives of his heart, but manipulation. 
So I've sculpted something I want to say and communicate to manipulate a reaction and a response. Um, that's huge. That can be very destructive. It's very interesting. Tons of uh, Christians and conservative uh, people are, have actually started shifting their views on him and Russia and the whole situation from that one two-hour conversation. Yeah. And because he articulated some traditional values and we believe in some things and we stand for some things. And communism has been um, opposed to religion from, from its beginning. And so it's fascinating how mm -hmm. communication yep. can be used to just in one conversation, all of a sudden things shift and change. Yep. But so, so why, don't, why don't we start with some of the fun, the fun negatives. So it, it, some of the common communication breakdowns, passive aggressive, silent treatment, things like that. Can you just kind of riff on that? Like sure. in your practice, what do you see as some of the main negative communication patterns and how would you comment on those? Okay. So uh, passive aggressive was one of the ones you meant. Uh, you said first there, and sarcasm can be in there. They can be pretty close there. Um, but sometimes you gotta look at the motive there. N Neil and I are very sarcastic to, like my comment about us showing up for support prayer, that was very sarcastic, it was a little passive aggressive. Yeah, I got it, I got yeah. it. <laughs> but, so you gotta be careful who your audience is there. I, I knew he'd get a kick out of that, and, and that's okay. But. Um, but to define passive aggressive, I, I might want to just quickly talk about what passive, assertive, aggressive, and passive aggressive is. Perfect. Is that okay? Perfect. So passive is when I let other people control me. I'm just not going to stand up for myself. I'm not going to speak for myself. I'm just going to let other people control me. Aggressive is letting others, um, is, is I want to control others. So that's my agenda. So passive is to control and to under-communicate, to be aggressive is probably to over-communicate and to be in, try to grab control. Assertive is a nice middle ground. It is to share communication. It is to um, talk about what I feel I think I want. Um, and it's back to respect. It's showing great self-respect and respect for the other. And even if you don't win or convince or persuade, you're happy about the way it went. And the other person is too. Um, so good assertive, commu I, I communicate, I share, I think, I feel, I want, those types of things. Um, passive aggressive, you can see where um, I'm being aggressive, I'm taking control, but I'm just doing it in a way that you might not catch on to. So it's like a little dart in your back and you walk away and you go, hey, wait a minute. You know, I don't know if you've had those conversations um, where it's just a little, it's a little underhanded and there's, or a, uh, a compliment with a backhand to it, um, that's, that would be passive aggressive. So again, it can be playful um, if you know your audience and, and we're kind of agreeing on that. But uh, other than that, it's, um, it's aggression. It's just in a quiet, uh, sneaky way. Okay. So, um, aggressive. So an aggressive is, is to control. That's, that's the goal. The, the aggressive is to control. I, I want control. Did you talk about assertive? Yeah. You already did? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you okay? I mean, no, I'm, in, I was take, I'm taking notes, but so yeah. why don't you give us, give us a response, give us a response. So, so somebody is being passive, what would you say to them to, to get that in a more of a healthy direction? I would say, tell me what you're thinking, feeling, and wanting. What's okay. your head, your heart, um, telling, what is it saying you want? And what's wrong, um, what's in the way of you telling me that or telling somebody that? Now, sometimes there, there's a time and a place to be passive. You know, if someone is holding a gun to my head, I, whatever you want, you know, I will give you, there, there, there's a place for that. Um, but, but more often than not, uh, you're not showing up and I can't have a relationship with you if you don't show up. So I, I need to know what you think, feel, and want. Yeah, it's so good. Um, so what about the aggressive? And the aggressive would be, um, an example of that might be, um, this is what we're going to do. Um, you're gonna be quiet here and listen to what I have to say. That, that might be more aggressive. So to that person, I would say, um, how would it be for you to hear and take, what's it gonna be like for you to give up the control there? What would it be like for you to stand shoulder to shoulder instead of toe to toe here? And really be interested and curious and, engage that way. 
So I know we always would trust that in a church setting, there, there's nothing abusive happening in relationships or conversations, and hopefully that's the case. We, I, I can't even picture somebody in our church, mm-hmm. you know, cussing each other out and ranting and raving or threatening, but that stuff does happen in, mm-hmm. in a setting where, let's say it's in a home and it's a child or a spouse or someone's being aggressive, how do you, how do you de-escalate and when, when is it actually dangerous? How does somebody know when this is actually abusive and then, then what would you do? So there's quite the continuum for abuse, but abuse is abuse. Um, so if aggression, maybe another word would be an attack. So let's okay. say someone said something that attacked you. This actually happened to me at our, at our old church. This lady came up to me and she said, um, I just really don't like the way you, um, you are with me. Like I, I walk towards you and you walk away and um, you just seem like you don't care about me at all. And I was like, what? <laughs> I just, uh, I found that really, I mean, it was a, t- it really took me back. And so I had to practice what I preach, and so I took a deep breath, and so then I employed active listening, because I knew that was gonna buy me time. <laughs> so I just kind of repeated back to her what, how she experienced me, and then, um, and then all I could do there was say, I am really sorry you experienced me like that. I do not wanna be experienced like that, and will you accept my apology? I'll have to really think about that um, because that certainly was my intention, and I don't want to do that to you or anyone else. And whew, it really surprised me. And I just watched her calm down, you know. And, and we were really great friends after that. It was really interesting. I, it, like that, that interaction really bonded us, um, which was very sweet. Mm. So, um, so I really appreciated that. So that might be a way to, when someone's being aggressive towards you, you're immediately going to feel it, like probably in your body, that, that, Ooh, it just really gets you. Take a deep breath, if you can, mirror back what they're saying to buy the time, and then ask a question. Um, and I really believe in humbling yourself as much as you can. I, people think humbling yourself gives away power, um, but if someone's angry and aggressive, they're not interested in being confronted back. It's just gonna escalate. So I, that's the approach I suggest yeah. in that situation. In every relationship and communication, oh my goodness, humility is not weakness. Humility releases grace, and grace is the power of God. The scripture makes that very clear. Humble yourselves. God gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud. Humility releases grace, and grace is the power of God. And when grace is at work in the room, things change. But um, one thing I found when you say mirror back to the person what they're saying is, is sometimes the person doesn't really mean what they're saying. So, if you, so this is what I'm hearing mm-hmm. from you. And based on what I'm hearing, this is how I'm interpreting it and responding. Is this what you mean? And, and if, to take that step before taking it personally and then defending. But I think this, that probably is true at times that people, they're poor communicators, yeah. so they're not yeah. clearly telling you how they feel. Right. In the circumstance I just shared, she meant it. She meant it. <laughs> she okay. did. And, um, <clears throat> and that's okay. Um, I, I know that season of my life, my head was in the clouds, and <clears throat> I, I can totally understand that I could have come off that way. I sure didn't want to. Neil and I just had a funny little interaction. This is an example of our dynamic where um, he's going to share some things right now uh, or in a few minutes. And um, so I said, oh, here's my notes on that. And he goes, okay, so this is what you want me to say. And I'm like, uh. <laughs> but I knew he was joking because I know him so well. And um, so, so what I said back to him is, um, my understanding is you wanted that, right? So. I'm okay with being wrong. I have to be okay with being wrong in that situation. So that's the other piece in, in mirroring back. Like, wait, my understanding was this. Is that what you intended? And, you know, of course, he was just joking. It's kind of a bad example. But that, I think, to your point. Yeah. Let's do one or two more on the passive aggressive because that's such an easy thing to fall into. It's so much easier to just hint or suggest or make a comment than uh-huh. to actually be clear and direct. Um, if I could have like 60 seconds of therapy with you, I, I have worked so hard on my personality. Um, I've, um, I, I've always been more serious and I'm, I'm witty and I love to have fun, but I'm, I'm much more, I'm more serious. 
I'm not shy, and I'm not like profoundly introvert, but on the scale, I'm, I'm very social. I love being with people. I love being up front, but I lean introvert. Right. And there are times when people don't know that I love people so deeply, but it can be an effort to reach out. And it's not because I don't feel it. It's because it's just my wiring. But a comment that I've heard a few times over the years some, would be something like, when I reach out to somebody, um, I've heard comments back, um, oh, nice to talk to you. Um, been here a year, and it's the first time you've said hello to me. And, and I don't hear that a lot, yeah. but, <laughs> I but felt that. anytime you get more than a handful of people, it's easy to, you don't mean to, but so what's a good response for that? I would say, oh boy, it sounds like I've disappointed you. Okay. And let them, let them share what's going on. What about when you call your mom? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks for calling. It's been a while. <laughs> Sounds like I've disappointed you. <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, it, it, is, it, it probably has been a while, Mom. I own it. You know, it's like I, I can tell by your voice you expected me to call more. And what does that look like? You yeah. know, because I, I don't want you to be disappointed. And I want us to come, I want us to be able to talk about this with you, without you being upset or angry with me. Okay, so good. Let's do a couple more of the negatives before we have, um, Neil's gonna share just on, there, there mm -hmm. are five main forms of communicating, and, but, but we tend to only think of one or two, so we'll get to that in just a second. So we've talked about passive aggressive. What are other things that you see? I mean, I wrote down silent treatment when there's unhealed issues, unresolved conflict, mm -hmm. but what are some other big ones? Um, so the silent treatment, that's, uh, that falls under the contempt umbrella, which I'll, maybe we'll talk about for a minute at the very end. So silent treatment can show up in two ways. It can be really, really abusive. Um, I heard a story of a guy who did not talk to his wife for two years. Uh, can you believe that? I mean, that, that's abusive. And so um, when we give our children the silent treatment, like when we shut down, we're so mad, we just can't talk to them, they, studies show their anxiety goes through the roof, and so do spouses. So. Mm. Uh, we really have to try not to do the silent treatment. Um, if we are so upset that nothing good is going to come out mm. of this mouth, I need to own that. And I need to say, I have to give myself a time out. I'm, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed or I'm just really angry and I'm not going to handle it well and I want to do better than that. So mm. I, I'm just going to be quiet and sequester myself or just, just give me a little bit and, and we'll come back. The key is to come back to it. Mm. But it as much as you can, do not give anyone the silent treatment. Yeah, because in a relationship, silence is deadly. Mm -hmm. They're not responding to your email. Wait, what's going on? Mm -hmm. They haven't responded to the text. Or, and it seems like in, re, in communication, if anything can be misread or misunderstood or misjudged, it will be. And that's, that's really powerful when you say that silent treatment actually raises anxiety levels. Mm -hmm. We were watching a show the other night, and we, there was a scene on the show where it was so powerful, but this... This person was, was sharing, and I don't know if this is true, but on the show he was sharing, Jonathan, you may know this, or Menjavars, that um, in war, that when um, injured soldiers are waiting for the medevac helicopter, when they hear the helicopter approaching, their vital signs start to improve. Just hearing the approach of rescue and they start to come back to life. Mm. And we, we, we talked after the program and we thought that is who we wanna be. And so even in communication, I don't, yeah. I don't wanna be the person that everybody cringe, or, you know, you, cause you know the person that you're gonna get the passive aggressive, you're gonna get the, the awkwardness, you're gonna get the weirdness. And um, but, so that was a great point. Okay, so passive, silent. Yeah. It, maybe some, the silent treatment is passive aggressive too. That may be in that okay. category. But um, okay, but when people need a break, like what what what's a good like silent? Tr sometimes you you are gonna freak out if you talk. So mm -hmm. what are the rules for? I'd say just give me a minute. <laughs> if you could eke that out, give me a minute, and and go for a walk, go pray, go journal, do something, but do not. I have learned when I am angry, I so admire those people when they are angry, they are steady and they are clear and concise. I regret everything that comes out of my mouth when I'm angry. So I know I have to shut up. So if, if I'm angry or overwhelmed, I have to say, I need a minute. Um, let me get back to you. And if I, depending on the person, I might be more vulnerable, say I'm super angry or, or whatever, but 
um, yeah. So remind us of the timeline because we talked about it last month. When when strong emotions hit us, there's a shelf life on that. Like you light a match and it flares up for a few seconds and yeah. comes down. What's the, like with anxiety? Is it was it 20 minutes? Or it's, what was it's 20 minutes it, and anger or two that that overwhelm in general unless you feed it. So if I go take uh, my time out and I go to my room and I go, I crumble, and I'm, and I'm feeding it, feeding it, feeding it, you know, what a jerk, <laughs> then it's gonna last longer. But if I go to really calm down, take breaths, just think it through, think about both sides, what happened, how do I wanna be when I come out of this room, all those kinds of things, now it will take 20 minutes for me to settle down. Okay, Yeah. good. So, which means you're allowed a little bit of, it's not silent treatment, but you're yeah. allowed to cool off, yes. you need to, but, but three days later, you shouldn't still be cooling off. Right, and it's so helpful to the person you're communicating with if you tell them, I will be back, okay. I just need a minute, okay. so, or 20. Okay. Are there others here? Uh, you had talked about unhealed issues. Um, I would look for hidden resentments, unforgiveness and traumas. In relationships, there's always perpetual issues. There are things that we just may never solve in our life together, um, and that's okay. We just want to be able to talk well about it. So, um, but if there's really hidden resentments, I would say go work on, talk to maybe even a third party about that. Uh, are there resentments? Are there traumas? Is there something or triggers that's going on there? So I think one, one of the pushbacks people sometimes have with the idea of therapy is it seems like once you open that door, when do you stop? Because it's endless issues. It's, you could dig into everything. Mm -hmm. so, so how do I know this is an unhealed issue that needs attention? Are there some signs to know that the way we're communicating is evidence that some, this is more than I'm not communicating clearly. There's something damaged. Are there indicators of that? Um, I think it's the way it sticks to you. And again, I'm, I'm very much in dead. The body's a tell. Um, so it's not just a story I'm telling. It's a, it's a story I'm feeling as I'm telling it. And yeah. the third party, it doesn't have to be a therapist. It can be a mentor, a small group, just someone you trust to be confidential that's yeah. there to help you. I have some very dear friends that are so helpful and, and will tell me the truth and I yeah. can bounce stuff off of. Yeah. Talk about the body a little bit more. Okay. Um, so you may know the name um, uh, Pete Scazzaro. He, he did, did some work on the emotionally healthy church, emotional healthy leadership and discipleship. He has one of those little silly quips, that, but, it, but it's memorable. He says, the body is a major prophet. You know, in scripture, we have minor prophets and major prophets. The body is a major prophet. It, what's happening in our body is mm -hmm. telling us something about the internal. Yeah. Yeah. Emotionally Healthy Discipleship is one of my favorite books. I think oh. that was a really good one that he wrote. Um, yeah. So when you said that church member said um, that to you, mm -hmm. I, I really felt, I literally felt that. And so that tells me now I want to say, okay, um, now I want to let that speak to me. What does that mean? Like, oh, my heart hurts. I, I recognize that. Where have I felt that before? That's that disappointment feeling. I'm not living up. I'm measuring. I'm not measuring. I'm not good enough. I've let someone down. I mean, it just could be anything. But, but just to take a minute to explore that. Yeah. And there's different, I don't know this well enough yet, but there's different parts of your body that can tend to signal different things. Like if you have tension in your shoulder, some, sometimes that's responsibility. I'm feeling really responsible for something hmm. or overly responsible for something. Um, here tends in the throat tends to be unspent tears or sadness that, that um, wow. this chest holds a lot of anxiety. Um, so get to know you and, and see if you can explore that a little bit. Hmm. That's good. It's a good tell. Yeah, very good. Um, you said unresolved conflict. Um, I think, uh, so there, there are those perpetual issues, and then there's also those deal breakers where we really have to have good conversations about, like, I, hmm. I, I, cannot, I cannot go on further because of this. Maybe, maybe again, it's that, that silent treatment or, or something that's just really, uh, may, maybe it's an addiction or something. I've... I've carried this with you as far as I can, and um, something's got to change, and we have to figure that out. So um, mm -hmm. that might be something like that. Um, but the three that I think are huge uh, in terms of negativity is, um, I guess I would call it pride. Mm -hmm. But in counseling, um, I call it, I have to be right. And so it's when I need to be right, there's no point in having a conversation. Now, 
Now it's me telling you what I want you to hear, and I'm not so interested. And the Bible calls that person a fool, honestly, yeah. <laughs> in the Proverbs. And um, so uh, watch out. I, I think that's a major killer of communication when I have to be right. What's the point then? Why, why, are, we, why are we stepping it's out? It's really interesting. When the Proverbs talks about that with a fool, it, it contradicts itself, at least on the surface, because it says, do not answer a fool according to their folly. And then a couple of verses later, it says, rebuke a fool. And like, wait, am I supposed to answer a fool or am I supposed to? And it looks like a contrast, but what it's actually saying is, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. You, you, you're you're going you're, you're gonna to lose either way. And so yeah. that's, that's a great way of, of framing that up. If, if yeah. that happens in the conversation, yep. then what do you do? You just get out of it? or It was Proverbs 18.2 that I, I had looked up. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Mm. That was the one I was thinking of. But yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, anyway, pride. Okay, pride. Um, def- and subcategories of that are defensiveness and justification. Okay, so if you're human, you're going to defend yourself, but you have to understand that that is going to break down the, com- the communication. Yeah. So as quick as you can catch it, like when that woman confronted me at church, did I want to defend myself? Did I want to justify the reasons why she may have? I absolutely did, but that was not going to bond us. It was not going to resolve anything. It was not going to get us anywhere. And when I see uh, more than one person at a time, a a family, a couple, whatever it is, parent, child, um, that's what I see the most in their breakdown is someone is so busy justifying, so busy defending, and children, and especially adult children, are really hurt by that. They, mm-hmm. they don't trust you because what defensiveness does is it says, I have to protect myself if, before I protect you. Mm-hmm. And uh, we don't really think about it like that, but really that's what it is. And so that can come across very self-serving and selfish. Mm-hmm. If, so I would, again, say, check that. Mm-hmm. So good. Uh, I guess let me just move on to a, a few things. By the way, be th- as you're thinking about your questions, let's, let's, if you don't mind, let's try and give Carol some real-time questions that we're wrestling with. Like, for instance, um, Jessica and I, we're very fortunate. We've, our, we're, we're in a great place. Our marriage is, we're very fortunate in our marriage. It's, it's, it's awesome. The one area that we tend to hang up in our communication is that um, there are times when um, I'm not doing a great job communicating what I'm feeling, and so Jessica's not responding to what I'm actually feeling in my heart. She's responding to my words, and her communication's perfect, but I feel like it's not actually hitting what I'm looking for, so I don't feel heard. And, and so we've had to talk that through at times, and she's had to, to realize, because if, if I get kind of fumbly in what I'm saying, she could either feel, well, that's not accurate. It's not just. I didn't actually do that. And, but then I'm feeling unheard in the process. And so my point in that is that like, that would be a great question to have Carol respond to. Um, our daughter, Amber, is a fantastic communicator. And we've always had amazing communication. But with addiction coming into her life, that damages things. And, and a re- we've had a real-time interaction where, where I, I heard myself saying things to her that I, I know isn't good, clear communication, but just the dynamics kind of put me in that place. And so very real-time questions like that, I think, would be where we should go with the, the second half of the night. But uh, let me have, can I shift it to Neil? Yeah. Neil, can you be, uh, here you go. So Neil actually is a communications professor, so I trust you guys have magical conversations at your home. <laughs> but just We do pretty well. I, I just can't believe these nights go super quick, mm-hmm. so we kind of need to keep moving. But there's five main forms of communication. Can you just summarize those real quick? And then sure. So I'm the actually going to read what Carol wrote for these. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm going to do is add kind of like um, Tony Romo at the Super Bowl. <laughs> That the Chiefs won. <laughs> and by the way, I've been a Chiefs fan since 1970. Yeah. And I've been waiting 50 years for that first <laughs> upbeated Super Bowl win a couple few years ago. So I'm very happy these days. <laughs> so, but I, but I am, but then I'm adding color commentary to the definitions. Just don't so. Chris Collins. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, I'm Tony Romo. <laughs> he likes the Chiefs, too. <laughs> and you're running out of time already. All right. <laughs> okay. So these are the five... I was assertive. Okay. Uh, <laughs> ...aspects, categories uh, that one might break uh, communication into. So number one was verbal, and it says actually engaging with one or more people, uh, what, uh, what is heard, what is heard, yeah. Pitch, tone, um, and intensity. So obviously, probably our most common way of communicating with other people is through verbal, what we say. And we certainly can always do a good job of maybe even pre-thinking what we say before we say that can keep us out of lots of trouble. Because sometimes, because once you say something, you cannot get that toothpaste back in the tube. And so if we can stop for a moment and think for a moment before we say it, how happy we will be that we haven't hurt that person unnecessarily. So, so. an example would be, listen to the way I say this. So sorry. So sorry. So sorry. <laughs> Same words, different tones, different intensity, different cadence. So, yeah. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> okay, second is nonverbal. Uh, this often, we often say more uh, than our words, which is so true. How many different ways do we communicate nonverbally beyond our words? What we, how we stand, how, what we do with our hands, uh, our facial expressions, our eye expression, what we look at while we're communicating with others. Are we nodding our heads as a way of saying, I'm understanding, I'm with you. Uh, do we shake our head no when we don't agree with something they say? Do we fold our arms? Uh, what do we do with our hands? All these different ways of communicating through our bodies, words are actually not the words, but like what we were just saying about the sounds we make, um, tones, and all those different aspects, uh, we communicate be uh, far beyond which what we say with our words. So one of the worst nonverbals you can do is eye rolling. Mm -hmm. So everyone does it, but try to not try to niche, nick that one out. That's just, ugh. it communicates so much. It's mm -hmm. so disrespectful, so. Okay. okay. Uh, visual, uh, images meant to convey meaning. Now, I guess you could in understand that in different ways. The way I'm thinking about images is when you share with others, can you give them good word pictures of what you're trying to say? Hmm. And if a good word picture comes in, it, it broadens the understanding, it makes it easier to understand if you can take those words, thoughts, and feelings and say, this is like when I and then convey a good word picture uh, makes it so much easier for others to pick up on that and understand it. Or visual can be actually a picture. So like those, those animal commercials, you know, where the real skinny animals come on, they break your heart. <laughs> those, those, or like something like this creates sort of an image of some sort. So, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a good image that says something, right? <laughs> anyway. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> that hangs in front of our house from September through December. <laughs> uh, next is written, uh, writing in any form. And, you know, we don't send letters to people anymore, right? It's usually a text message, or if we really want to be loving, we'll send an actual email. <laughs> but what happened to writing letters to people? And the US, United States Postal Service is going broke, I think, because we don't use stamps anymore. And, you know, and it's nice, and you can, it's just so nice. How many of us love to get a letter in the mailbox, right, with a stamp? Oh, it's wonderful. But at the same time, um, emails, text messages are quick, easy, convenient. The danger, however, is once you send something through, you can burn a letter and it doesn't exist. Once you send something through the internet, you can never, it's always out there. You can never get rid of it. Somewhere, some way, somehow, if somebody wanted to find something, they can find it. And so, again, be very careful with how you communicate 
and probably don't send an, a text or an email when you're angry because mm -hmm. it's there forever. So well, be careful. It, written word represents you as much as spoken word. Mm -hmm. And, and since that is the way we primarily communicate now, it's definitely worth learning how to communicate well in those mediums. Um, so Isaiah, uh, does, he, he, he's, he will not send long emails. He hates long mm -hmm. emails. He sends very brief texts. He tries to keep everything super brief to eliminate confusion. The, the downside to that is there are times I'll send them a little mushy text and I get a yes. Or, and I'm like, and then okay. like, wait, see, but, and, but I, I, but this is important. Um, somebody emailed me the other day and the email said, Chris, we need to talk. We had an incredible talk. It was an incredible meeting, but the, the, that was the email that I got. So then what does my mind do? Like, wait, what did I do? And so, so, so you, no matter how beautiful you think your, your well sculpted text message is, do not send it. I mean, this, the, the, there's limits to how much you can communicate with emojis and, and so, but that is how we communicate now. So, but those are simple things. So, okay, anyway, one more. You have listening? All right, listening. So what I have learned in the textbooks is there are several forms of listening. And the key about this is, is in a communication experience, what type of communicate or excuse me listening should I be practicing right now? For example, there is what is called task oriented listening. This is where you have a new job and your boss is trying to train you in a skill or a, a responsibility and so you have to get the right information in the right order, how long, how much, you know, all that. I still remember when I worked in a pizza restaurant in high school and college learning how to make the dough and this much salt, this much sugar, this much yeast, this much water, and then the 25 pound bag of flour. <laughs> so you gotta get it in the right order, that's one. Another one is, um, oh, uh, appreciative listening. This is where there's no responsibility, there's no test, there's no follow-up, there's no quiz. It was like a few years ago, I got to go see my favorite band, Electric Light Orchestra, and it was wonderful at the, um, former home of the LA Lakers at the forum down there. Uh, there is uh, comprehensive listening, and that's probably what you are mostly doing tonight, is gathering in the information, maybe taking notes, wanting to remember that idea that Carol and Chris shared about how to be a more effective communicator. But we're gathering, just gathering, gathering. Another type is what is called, um, um, why am I blanking out on this? Uh, Oh, hang on. It's another type of listening. The word will click in my head in a minute. Uh, as I'm getting older, I'm noticing there's a lot more <laughs> holes in my, my memory. So, but this is a type where you are critical listening. And don't take the word critical as mean-spirited or angry or hostile. What it means is I'm looking to learn, but also to evaluate and critique while I'm listening. Do I agree with that? Do I not agree with that? Did I read an article about that? What do I think about that? What do I want to do with that information? It's really working and grinding it in our minds as we're listening and giving ourselves homework to do in the future. So it's a great tool. We should all be critical listeners in that way. Now, do you want to use critical listening when it comes to being a good listener to a friend? Probably not. That's not the right choice of the selection. The one that comes closest in this list, I think, that would fit with what they're sharing is what is called emotive listening. That is, think about you went to bed, there's a phone call at 11 o'clock at night, and it's a friend on the phone who just broke up with their boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, etc., and they just need somebody to talk to. And think of those different types. None of those other types really are effective. But listening, minimal questions, no judgment. They probably don't want your advice. They just want somebody to listen to what they have to say. And it may take time. It might take some tears. But just good listening. And then maybe asking a question here or there, but not a whole lot of questions. Just listen to what they're having to say. And let them know that you care 
and you're there, and you're willing to give them the time to listen. I had one person in the church, and that person, when they would call, I had to, in my head, say, I need to give them an hour, an hour and a half. That's the way that person experienced love, is by people listening. And so I just set aside what I was doing, and just listened, 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 trying to practice that emotive type of listening. So that's great. Neil. So that, All right. that's an uh, important part is being there, you know, being present, really being there, um, so people can feel listened to. That's so good. Okay, so we'll, we'll do a break in just a couple minutes. Let me just fire several questions at you. That again, each of these questions could be, you know, big long okay. spiel answers, but. Um, so when, when, when Christine Leitner was here, when we were talking about parenting adult children, she used the metaphor that if uh, so a lot of issues in relationships and communication, it's only a speed bump issue. It's not a big deal. And you can clunk your way through it and you're fine. But if you don't resolve it, the next time a speed bump comes up, it sits on top of that speed bump. It's still, the issue is still small. It's just sitting on top of another small issue. And then if that continues to have unresolved conflict, you end up with a, a brick wall that you slam into in your relationship. It doesn't mean any of the issues are a brick wall issue. It means a brick wall has been built. And so what, what if there are people sitting here and they love what you're saying of, I want, I want to be Christ-like in this. I want to be loving and kind, but we've got this brick wall. Um, I don't want to be a jerk, but so how do I communicate well? Are you saying um, they're up against a brick wall yeah. or they yeah. are Every the brick Every time wall? we start talking, we tie up. And I don't want to because I love you. And I, you know, it, it could be, this is my kid. I don't want to tie up with you or, but that keeps happening. Th this for me goes back to what we talked about in another conversation about being willing to look through another lens. So there, in part of that, who do you want to show up as? It has to be someone who's open um, I'm welcoming of another perspective, okay. and I'm looking for things to agree with, and I'm looking for areas where I could be wrong. Okay. And I think all those things are going to help you move through maybe knocking out some bricks. So periods are better than commas. I hear you, period. <laughs> and now I'll tell you versus immediately going into our... Mm -hmm. But with that, a lot of people say, I hear you, I hear you. Well, the person doesn't feel heard. Okay. What did you hear? <laughs> you, so I hear you is not good enough, usually. Usually. Okay. It has to be, I think I hear you. I think what you're trying to tell me is blah, 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 blah. Is that right? So it's that humility. Do you hear the humility in that? That has to be there. So as a professional therapist, how much stock do you give to the whole idea of understanding a person's temperament? Um, Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram 3. Like, should that factor into how she communicates with me or how the staff interacts with me or... I, well, I think Not Enneagram that, specifically, but right. just the idea of temperament I, I think it type. can uh, help. I hope it gives you grace. Like, if you know that, like, mm -hmm. Enneagram 8 is going to be super conflict with con super comfortable with conflict and volatility and actually loves it. Can we have a good fight? I'll feel closer to you if we do. And so it helps me to know that because then I'm not going to take that personally and not going to, you know, be offended by it. So in those or, or knowing that maybe a different person is a, more of a conflict avoider, they're really uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. um, that maybe you should be a little less direct, a little more gentle with that person. I think that could be helpful. Because don't you think studying the person that you're in relationship with is an act of love? Oh, yeah. So, so our friend Rachel is here, and Rachel has three kids, and mm -hmm. she's so good at understanding the nuance of how they communicate mm -hmm. and experience love. We've talked about that, that you're, you're really good. But a lot of people don't do that. Not everybody takes the time to let me truly figure out where they're coming from for them and master that understanding. So that would be more ag an aggressive approach. You have to show up how I want you to. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stay in control. I'm going to okay. be me. Mm -hmm. So give us a, an amazing Carol Montgomery one, one or two liner mm -hmm. on how do you communicate with your boss? Um, well, there is a power differential there. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to acknowledge that. Um, but I honestly would not want that to be different than if you were the boss. Um, so I think being the, employing the same things, um, asking clarifying questions, uh, especially if you think something happened that wasn't fair, didn't make sense, try and remember it makes sense to them. That's why they employed it. And so 
again, asking questions, being respectful, not demanding, but also uh, don't hesitate to show up for you and advocate for yourself with the I feel I think I want assertive language. So good. So if you could get your people in your office to just, just please do these two or three things, what would they be to have better communication and relationships? I think it, w it would be more of a not. Don't show up defensive or justifying. Try and drop those things. Contempt is the worst of all. Uh, that's I'm looking down my nose at you. That's the eye rolling, the mocking, the name calling. It's abusive. It's, it's very abusive, mm -hmm. emotionally and physically in a lot of ways. So I'd say... Um, don't be like look for contempt if you've got that get get rid of that um try not to be defensive and try not to justify and then the do's would be want to see it from another person's point of view want to be curious that's good it's really interesting in um western and eastern theology so like in western culture like we're in theologians tend to describe God by trying to identify the positive aspects of God. God is just and loving and merciful and all these things. In the Eastern church, which we're not nearly as familiar with, so you, you, have, so you, have, you have Western Protestantism, you have Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. In the Eastern church, their theologians describe God by the negatives. God is too immense for me to fully understand, but I know he's not this. And so by, by process of God is not this, not this, they get a picture of who God actually is. And that's actually an interesting way of approaching relationships. So even to sit with the key relationships in your life and who do I want to be? Who do I not want to be? What do I want to bring to this? What do I not want to bring to this? And in, in, in dealing with addiction right now, Jessica and I, there's a little mantra we're using. A lot of times in situations, I can't fix this, I can't make it better, but I can make it worse. And I can't fix it right now, but I, but I could damage it. And so one of the things I want to do is not make it worse. Very good. And I think too, um, the verse, one of the verses Don shared this morning about humble yourself um, under the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up at the right time. Trust that. Yeah. To, to show up to a, a conflict or conversation humble and open, and you don't need to exalt yourself. Let, let God bring that around for you. Um, well, thank you. Um, something that um, someone reminded me of is a set model while you're looking through the cards. Can I just explain that? It's when there's, when you're in a high fire situation is the best way I can describe it. Someone is really emotionally hot. Maybe we both are. Um, the, 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 the SET model, S-E-T. S stands for supportive. So that basically starts with, I agree or you're right. You find something to agree with or say you're right about. Um, so... Um, somebody may say, uh, you, like that lady, you, you know, you are acting this way towards me. And for me to be able to say, you know, you're right. I can be kind of unattentive and come across that way. I, I can really agree with that. Okay. E is empathy. Uh, and empathy says, uh, if I were you, I would feel like this, or it sounds like you feel this way. So hers, I, that must have been terrible to experience me like that. You must have felt rejected. Um, I'm sure that I, I'm, I, that would have been terrible. Um, and then the T is the now the truth. And that's where most people want to go, I want to tell the truth, I want to speak my truth. And you often can if you do the S and the E. And people will say, oh, I've done that. And I'm like, no, you haven't. <laughs> because you have to do both. You have to do the I agree with you, you're right. Think about a roaring lion now begins to calm down and start purring because you're right and your feelings are right even. And I would feel them too. They make all the sense in the world. And then the truth is, I want to make this better. Uh, the truth is, I have had too much on my mind, and this is a good reminder that, you know, I've been this. Or the truth might, uh, another example is this woman came, dropped off her kids on a, on a divorce situation, and she'd run into traffic, and she was furious, and she came to the door cussing up a storm. I can't believe this traffic. I hate this. I can't believe why well, you got to meet me first, blah, 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 blah. And so the husband had learned this method, and he said, you're right, Friday night traffic is the worst, and it, uh, and it 
E. It's so frustrating sitting in that traffic and trying to get here in time and dealing with all the noise and the stress of that. T. The truth is you cannot scream and yell and cuss at me on my doorstep. That's not good for the kids or anybody else. And so she was just kind of quiet and went to her car. You know, So that takes a lot of practice. I had to practice that for like a year before I could even get it down, but it's worth practicing. It's a really effective tool. S-E-T. So okay. good. And yeah, Jessica's genius at these steps and things you're talking about. So I should have had you up here, <laughs> babe. Um, okay, before we get into these questions, so Dahlia is sitting on the second row. She's mm -hmm. like a second daughter to me. <laughs> I've known her since first grade. She was friends with my daughter. I coached Aww. her in U8 soccer or something Aww. like that. Um, she's here with a special friend. So mm -hmm. give them 30 seconds of communication advice. And they've already heard an hour of it, but specifically... If they're going to have good, as they figure out where this is going, and, and I, I need to speak into that of where it's going, but if, as they... So as what this, I, is your question, what would I tell a young couple? Sure, let's say it that way. I mirrored, that was mirroring, because his question was not clear to me, or is yeah. the direction. No, I, I, was, I was getting off track, so... <laughs> okay. Um, so... Uh, because, well, it, because communicating at, you know, 18, 19, 20, you're figuring yeah. yourself out. yeah. Well, my one thing that's not really a communication thing I tell every couple is time is your friend. And I really like the two-year idea. <laughs> um, so I would say to every couple, but young couples, watch when you're falling in love and things are, or you're just falling in friendship, whatever it is, I don't know your situation, but um, <laughs> as, as you're interacting and you bump up against one another being stressed or angry, um, Try not to join it, but to um, be curious about it. That, that, I, and I say that word all the time. But so yeah, just try, so um, maybe I'm going off about something and, and to so be good. able to just stay in who you are and not join it and just try to understand it and ask some good questions and let everybody's nervous system calm down. A lot of times we perceive a threat and now we're, we're interacting from a threat point of view, a threatened yeah. point of view, and let's calm down. Because when we're operating in humility and we're wanting to bring humility and love to a relationship or a situation, humility allows us to move to the same side of the table. So instead of us sitting opposite each other in conflict, we can, we can move the issue out away from us a little bit. And humility and that desire, I, I, want, to, I want to lift you and build you up and value you and respect you. Um, it, 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 it does exactly what you said. It, it, I'm not joining into the issue. I'm becoming a teammate with you in, in facing the issue. Right. Toe-to-toe -to -toe versus shoulder-to-shoulder. -shoulder. As much as you can, get shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder and look at the issue rather than toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Very good. Okay. How do you move away from defensiveness when that's not your heart? Um, practice. <laughs> practice makes progress. Okay. <laughs> so, so I think... I. I I'm not sure exactly what you're saying there, but what I run into in my counseling appointments is, this just happened uh, yesterday morning, I can't not justify that person's wrong. I can't defend it, I'm not wrong. You know, try harder. I, uh, that person I just said, this is, think of this as a little girl saying, um, I need you in a different way and you're not showing up that way. Whatever it takes to humble yourself, soften yourself, um, see that person through the eyes of compassion. Think about all the people that Jesus interacted with were doing all kinds of naughty things, and they were sort of defensive and justifying, and he just showed up with compassion. He didn't deny that what they were doing was wrong, but he, he entered into a conversation that was productive and constructive. And so. Do you think it's safe, is it fair to say somebody gets defensive when they feel like they're being unfairly judged or, or, or misunderstood? You're missing my mm -hmm. motives. Yeah, and chances are, you know, that's the case. It doesn't matter. Okay. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, it, slow down the conversation, that's a big thing. Um, one of the hallmarks of aggressiveness is that sense of urgency. So if you can slow it down a little bit and, and um, do some reflective listening and... and I, I tend to always want to give people the benefit of the doubt. So um, if, if I'm really defensive, I'll just own that. I'm feeling really defensive. And so either you are accusing me of something and I don't like it, or, or you're not and I'm misunderstanding. And what, what might 
what might be the truth here. And but Carol, I'm I'm not being defensive. I just you, I, I want to explain what I was doing. I, I don't think you're understanding what I was saying. <laughs> then you're probably right. I'm not understanding, and I want to understand. So let's try again. Okay, but if you're accusing me of being defensive, you're not going to respond that way. <laughs> so. If, so, like, what, how, how, um, if, if I, if you're saying I'm defensive, and I'm not, I'm trying to explain, what do I do? Okay. Uh, I would say, I think it's okay just to say, maybe I am defensive, but this is really important to me. I feel passionate about it. And I don't mean to come across defensive. I might be, because this is important to me. Okay. Okay. We could talk more and more on the questions, but let me, let me fire through. Okay. okay, so explain the difference between humility and being passive, and then explain meekness in the context of communication. Good, 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 good question. Um, so passive says I don't count. Um, meekness and humility understands their value. They understand mm. that they do count. So it's just a whole different, it's like this quiet confidence that says, I don't need to defend myself, um, be right, all this. It's, um, I, I, that's how I see it differently. But when you're passive, again, not that there aren't times to be that, but it might be saying, I just, I just don't count, I don't matter. And that, then we have the doormat syndrome and we go into all kinds of enabling behaviors and all kinds of things that just don't work long term. Okay. How many of you would just say that in your communication, you struggle with wanting to be right? Or if you're misunderstood, you want to drive your point home until it's... Under okay. So, so, so that, that's understandable because I don't want to be misjudged. I want to be understood, but, but talk us through that again. Oh, I love being right. Yeah. yeah. It's really gratifying. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the question is what? Well... Well, in the context of, of what you were saying of meekness and humility and passive, and um, uh, I, I, I want to be—I want to be right. It's important to me to be right. But how do I express humility in that? Is it because I, I care about? I want you to understand. And what does humility look like in that setting? Well, humility doesn't mean lack of passion. Um, okay. So I think that's an important part. It's—it's it's just I just not. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, I'm not insisting on my own way. I, I, I don't need to insist on my own way. I feel very strongly about this. I think I'm right. That's why I'm asserting it. But I'm open. And again, we may walk away in dis disagreement, but I do want to say what I want to say, uh, yeah. what, I need, what I feel I need to say. So Yeah. So it's, it's easier said than done, but in that moment, I want you friend, child, sweetheart, I want you more than I want to be right. Mm -hmm. If I can touch your heart, if I can connect with you, then there's enough, again, humility that releases grace, and then we can sort out the details of right or wrong or what did or didn't yeah. happen. But And I also think asking permission when you really have that thing that you just feel so important is really respectful, too, in communication. I think I've shared with you before, um, my, my middle son was dating a girl that... I just wasn't thinking this was the right one at all. And so I, I just told him, I said, may I have your permission to just say a couple things, a couple concerns I see, and if you don't want me to, it's unsolicited advice, I don't want to do that. But is it okay if I just share a couple thoughts based on what you're saying? And usually they say yes when you're that respectful again. And so, so we did, and I said, these are my concerns, and that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm going to try my hardest never to bring it up again. If you choose her, I will find a way to love her, um, and that's my role. But that's... Um, and he, he just really appreciates it. And I try to always do that. I always try to say, can I, can I speak into this for a second? I've got an opinion about this. And I think that's really polite. Do you think that to the point of passive, passivity here, would, would shutting down be a form of being passive? We've talked oh, yeah. about silent treatment, but sometimes you just, you withdraw and shut down. I'm not trying to hurt you, but that's yeah. my, re my default. And that's an effect of the nervous system too. Oh, that's another version of overwhelm is shutting down. So that could be it. And again, 20 minutes. If you, if you take care of that and understand what it is, do soothing kinds of behavior, you'll be back. Yeah. Is, do you want to say anything else on this? I feel like I mishandled that question. But did, did, did we cover that? Explain the difference between humility. I don't. We should ask you guys. Do you think we did okay on explain the difference between humility and passivity? 
Humility is, again, a quiet confidence. It's knowing who you are as a person in the Lord. Um, I don't, I, I'm under the hand of God, so I can wait. Um, that's humility. Um, passive is, I don't matter. I don't care. I'm not worth it. You're more important. Everybody's more important. Is that, is that clearer? Do you feel like? Okay. And then um, meekness in the, in the context of communication. Um, do, you, do you need any more? Do you feel like that's... When I'm, I'm meek, it's that, um, um, I think patient is, is, a, is a better word there, that I, I'm patient, I can wait, um, I can take my turn, I can fully hear you out. It does not mean I'm passive, though. It means that um, I will wait for the right turn, and I will say something. Yeah. Well, we... Can I ask a follow-up question, just because it, it, it's scary for me? Mm -hmm. so, like, just what you were saying about... Um, and in clarifying how to communicate well with that. So I'm a very big, I have to be right kind of person. Like, the sky is blue right. The sky is blue. So I know I'm right, but the other person isn't doing that. You're saying that good communication is it doesn't matter because we have to value that other person's opinion as highly as we value our own and decide whether or not to continue that conversation and how we would continue that conversation. Great question. So um, I want to respect that person's right to their opinion, but I want to be clear I don't agree with it. And there's a place for that too. Yeah. So the person is more important than the color of the sky. Yes. But, when, but if that's clear, you can talk about the color of the sky. Right. Yeah, you don't right. have to give up your convictions, but it's the value and relationship that comes first. And depending on how it's going, that might be several conversations. And we want to have a good first conversation so that we can have more conversations about it. Yeah. 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 So we all know that that meek term, we, we hear it all the time in sermons, that it refers to the, the, the breaking of a stallion. So it's not, it's not the lack of strength. Part of it is, is tone, it's gentleness. So to be meek in a conversation is, is gentle. Um, if you're super intense, you might be so kind and gracious in your heart, but it doesn't feel that way. So it's easily entreated. It's um, a way of, um, uh, Caitlin? Oh, I was just gonna say on that note, like, what do you have to say for the people who are described as intense their whole lives? How, how do you overcome that? Yeah. And let me repeat that just since we're, we're recording and live streaming. The question is, if you've been called intense your whole life, or you are intense, and if you are intense, God made you that way, and so I it's okay it. to be that mm -hmm. way, but how do you take that good part of your nature and not let that um, affect communication, or it just, it just hurts, and I don't want to come across that way, so how do I, how do I handle that? Yeah. So first of all, I would find a way to like that about yourself. I hope you do. Um, I think that's a really important starting point. Wow. Um, and from there, if you like who you are and you know you're intense and that's just part of your personality, then I want to say, um, no, whoever you're talking about, I know I can come across that way, so you let me, because there's other people that are be like, yeah, intensity, let's match there. You know, I, I imagine, I hope you've had other people that are like, I love your intensity, let's go intense together. You know, that's, that's really great. But... If you're okay with it, then you can say, hey, I know I can be intense. If it's too much for you, I'm going to work on dialing it down a little bit so we can have a better conversation and more conversations. Please let me know. I don't want you to have to read people's minds about that or their body language. Invite them to tell you. Um, and, and be okay with it. That's huge. So good. How do you rebuild communication if it's broken down? Time, time and practice and self-awareness, what it was my contribution to the breakdown, and that's the only part you can fix. Mm. And it's so frustrating when you can't fix the other side, you, um, and you might have to wait for time. But yeah, just keep, really, maybe there's something you learned tonight that's like, man, I think I might have done that. And begin working there, and slowly but surely work away at it, own it, own it, own it. It's so disengage. It's it's so um, inviting and disarming when you just own your part in things. So I think the brilliance of the Christian faith too is that we're not alone in this. Because so if you're having to own your stuff and you're waiting for the other person to deal with their stuff, you don't have to wait alone. The the Holy Spirit is present to 
okay, I, I'm not going to make this worse. I'm doing my part, and now I have to wait because I can't control. And since I can't control, heal me, fill me, save me, rescue me, empower me um, so that I can be who I want to be in that moment. But, but you're saying model what you want. Don't quit. And beyond that, what can you do except give it time and, yeah. and trust, trust the Lord? Check your motives. Okay. You know, is my motives to correct you <laughs> and to be right? Or is it really to repair this um, and, and be patient with the process that might take? Okay, my spouse always thinks I'm attacking them, and I'm not sure why. Better ask them why. You know, that, start, start there. Why are you feeling that way? That's, I don't want, that's not who I want to be. I want to be someone who is gracious and gentle and open. And um, now that being said, there are people that just um, are, for whatever reason, usually from their family of origin, they've had to have that posture of defensiveness and protectiveness. So talk about that, um, if that's part of it. But um, they, that's the, the meta communication when we talk about how we're communicating. Um, I would have try to have that conversation like you you've said this a lot and I I want to know where it's coming from because that's not my motives that's not my intention um, I want to fix that is there a way I can say things differently or is that some healing that needs to take place in you and how do you ask that without offending or setting them off like how do I ask you know if this is a historical family thing and that's why you're so defensive and you think I'm attacking you how do I bring that up in a, in a disarming way? I would always say I am quite capable of attacking you. I am quite capable of those kinds of characteristics. And again, I don't want to do that. I am capable of that. Um, I, because it wasn't my intention, I'm surprised you feel, feel that way. Can we look at what that's about? Okay. How did you become you? <laughs> <laughs> I read. How do we bottle that up? <laughs> okay, speaking of reading, I have a question here. Um, can you recommend an easy-to-read primer book on communication, if you have a go-to communication recommendation, uh, communication book? You know, one of my favorite ones, it's an old one. Um, it used to be called Boundaries Face-to-Face, -face, and then it was republished with a really difficult title, something like How to Have That Difficult Conversation subtitle you've been wanting to have or something like that. But it's a Henry Cloud, John Townsend duo. I've always really liked their writing a lot. So it's an older book. I really, really like it. Um, and I'll, I, maybe I could come up with a little book list and have that available. Sure. I'm not, I'm not, they're not popping up in my head right now. Okay. Um, how, did, how do you deal with parental authority in doing what they say? So I'm assuming this is we're grown-ups and I have a grown-up parent. I'm... How, how, I think that's probably what the question is in this room, but what, what do you... I, I think with aging parents, you think that's what that's about, maybe? Or, I don't know who asked the question. Is, okay. that, is that what the question is? Um, the, the roles change. And so um, I think having a conversation about, again, the, the meta-communication, we'll have a conversation about what's going on um, to say... You know, things are changing. I still want to respect and honor you as my parent, yet I have to take a more directive approach. Um, how can we do this well? We're both going to step on each other's toes and get hurt feelings, but, you know, I really want to lock arms with you and do this together and do it well. I just think having the conversation mm -hmm. about it, it gets tricky when we move into the mm -hmm. dementia and Alzheimer and the angry stuff. You just have to do the best you can with that, um, trying to understand mm -hmm. that... Um, they're doing the best they can, that their brain is firing all over the place. And, but I think that sooner you can have the conversation about things are shifting and changing and our roles are changing a little bit and we both want to do this well, I think, and what are your ideas about that? And what's it going to be like for you if I say, Mom, it's time, you got to give up your driver's license and are, are we going to be okay with those kinds of conversations? And so I think just talk about it. You know, it's so interesting in Scripture regarding parents, um, I mean, Jesus modeled for us how to treat a parent when he's hanging on the cross and he cared about his mother and said, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And the Bible tells us to love each other, but it's really interesting, and this cuts both ways, but the Bible doesn't tell children to love their parents. 
it, it tells children to honor their parents and respect their parents. And of course, we're supposed to love everybody. It's, Jesus said, love your enemies. And then he later on said, your enemies will be the members of your own household. So yes, that applies to mom and dad. But it's really interesting when the scripture specifically addresses parents and children, it tells parents to respect. And I think that's just God's understanding that that probably most parents are easy to love, but there are parents that it's probably impossible for that child based on what they went through or a trauma they experienced, and yet we can respect. And I want my girls to adore me, so I hope that verse doesn't apply to me. Mm. It, 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 that's why it cuts both ways. It's, it's scary. But as we relate with our parents, um, we, we can communicate in respectful ways, uh, e- even if it's, it's difficult. Uh, and I think you can, we can feel so guilty when... We're struggling with um, with our parents um, or our kids, but I mean, respect is always yeah. possible. And I think get over that. <clears throat> it's not probably going to be one conversation. These are a series of conversations, and we want each of them to not be terribly long and just productive. You kind of answered this earlier, but let's take one more run at it. What's a healthy way to de-escalate an argument with an aggressive person and then proceed in a healthy way? I really like that set model for that. When someone's being aggressive or they're emotionally dysregulated, um, use that. Here's the things you're saying I agree with. um, And here's the feelings I understand and can relate to. Here's my truth. You got to take it down a notch because I can't hear what you're trying to say as effectively as I need to with how you're talking to me right now. I want to, but I can't. So why don't we take a time out? Now your own nervous system is going, ooh, in those kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. So you gotta work on that. You gotta work on calming that, but. Is there language that's helpful or to de-escalate any kinds of things to say? And what you just said is language and is helpful, but, Mm -hmm. because I know certain, some things would inflame the situation more, but. Well, positive, some positive affirmations (laughs) might be good to employ there, like, Um, I know you're doing the best you can here. I know you're carrying a lot. Um, Those kinds of things can really, again, get the roaring lion purring a little bit. So now I'm on your side and I'm shoulder to shoulder with you instead of toe to toe. That's good. This election year promises to be divisive. How can we stay in relationships with those who disagree? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So... I, the, the, the sentence I find myself using a lot is, um, based on your research, you've come to those conclusions, and I have to respect that. I hope you can respect that based on my research, I've come to a different conclusion. And I'm, I, I hope, I think, maybe we can talk about it um, and share our conclusions, but we might not be able to um, because this is so heated and hot, so we've got to figure that out as well. Hmm. But that's usually what I say. Based on your research, I get you've come to where you are. You believe what you believe. Based on my feeds and outlets and reading, here's where I am. And we may we may have to be disagreeing to be dis agree to disagree. Can we still be friends? Is there a way we can do that? So so maybe try and just advise us a little bit more on that because uh, religion and politics are it's an externalization of a person's most deeply held Mm -hmm. values. So the reason we're so passionate about politics is it's a reflection mm-hmm. of our deepest values. And so you step on my politics, you're stepping on yes. me. You step on my faith, you're stepping on me. And so some people have a, they have a much stronger conviction about their beliefs than mm-hmm. relationships. My opinion, and this is just opinion, I, my approach to people will always be, I care about you more than I care about who's president. And I want to stay in relationship with you, even if we disagree on every other issue. There are other people, though, that say that there are some causes and issues that are so important. I will never back down on this issue because of how important it is, even if that means we have to part ways in our relationship. And so do you have any... I think I like what you said about the values. I think even affirming that can be so helpful for people. So to be able to say, um, you have really cool values, and what I hear you saying is based on those, and I really love that about you. Um, and I can see why you believe that you do. And I will think about what you've said. It may, it may even be that. And are you okay if I just think about it and can't wholeheartedly agree yet? Um, 
That might be another approach. That's tricky though. Is it okay just to not have the conversation at all and just avoid it? <laughs> uh, if, if you can, um, but if they're coming right to you with it, um, you might not be able, I mean, you can say, man, we get in a fight every time we talk about this and I'm just not up for that right now. <laughs> um, that's okay. But, yeah. Talk to us about your word curiosity because that could be helpful in this. Of You bring it up all the time. I do. Yeah, it's the crux of my job is to just keep being curious. And I do think, I, I do always want to know why people believe what they believe. Mm -hmm. What is it about that person that sold you um, or didn't? <laughs> um, so I think that's a way to be really curious there about that candidate. Um, you seem super um, pro there. And tell me about that. And how did you become that? What's that like? What's that based on? What values inside does that align with. And by the way, when we move into talking about cultural questions, which we'll do later on, but we could also talk about it at any time, um, that's gigantic. Um, tr help me understand. And I care about you enough to understand what you feel and why do you feel it? And how did you come up with that? And how was that shaped? And what does this mean? And tell me more. And then uh, I think that's really huge. Um, my brother and I are closer than we've ever been in our lives. Our relationship's better than ever. Um, he, he did a, a, something on TV once that was like very demeaning toward Christianity. It was a, he did a, something that was like it was deeply offensive. And if I ever said or did something that was reflective on parts of his life in that same way, he would just never have been able to forgive me. And, and so it was an interesting moment where Jessica and I were like, how do we respond to this? Because that's deeply offensive. And like you're, you're, you're mocking the things that are most important to me. Um, but, but, but he and I both have made the commitment that um, that we're in relationship, and I want to be in his life, his entire life. And so I've taken the approach of help me understand your causes and why are you passionate about what you're passionate about? Because I, I, I love to promote a great cause, and so I admire that in you. And, and, um, and it just it seems like trying to understand, trying to be curious, trying to love, trying to put the other person first, again, it releases grace. And builds bridges. Yeah. Yeah. But think about it. What if he said, help me understand how you came to that conclusion? You know, now that's a whole different message based on what Neil was teaching us, right? So really do that with humility. Really mean it. Okay. So one more written down here. And then if we have time, we can take a, see if there's more live. But um, I'm trying to listen to respond, but you're not hearing what I'm saying. Um, Barry, is this you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to just tell us your question? I'm trying to, okay. Uh, I'm a horrible communicator, uh, first of all. I, I, I have a lot of anger issues and things, so when I, I feel that first attack, I try to express what I'm saying, and the other person is listening with, they're already got their argument set up of how they're going to show me that I'm wrong. That just takes it to a whole nother level. And it's not, you're not listening to hear what's really bothering me. You're listening to respond to what I'm saying because you feel like you're being attacked because I'm so angry. Yeah, that's a tricky dance that you just set up there. Um, <laughs> and I guess, I, I guess I, what I would say, Barry, is um, why is the conversation started in the first place? Um, are, are you telling them something they don't want to hear, they didn't ask to hear, they didn't? So check that. Um, if they ask you a legitimate question and you're just responding, um, you can always ask them, what is it about my response that got that response from you? Um, Metacommunication again. So um, and I, it's slowing down the conversation. You got to be okay with that. Um, and trying to build a relationship rather than a fighting of words. So. The second half of that question is, how many weeks do you have available in your calendar? <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> it, takes a, it takes a lot of practice, you know, and some of us are more intense or a little fiery, and um, I don't think that's a bad thing. You just have to learn how to keep it on a leash and make sure you don't let go of it to that leash unless it's absolutely necessary. So... Practice calming yourself down. Practice giving the person the benefit of the doubt, thinking they want the best. 
Um, all those things can really begin to change your mindset and make you less defensive and, and again, more of that toe-to-toe -to -toe rather than shoulder-to-shoulder. -shoulder. So, so during the break, Danny and I and Amanda were talking, and it, it just it triggered a thought that you, you mentioned practice and hard work and somebody's asking for a book to read. I don't want to say this in a, like a beat-you-up or condemning way, but, but for all of us, I, sometimes I think it's helpful to ask the question, how hard am I really trying to, to learn and grow? And, and do I really want to be a great communicator? Because, you know, we, we've invested a lot in our vocations. And now we're, you know, we're, we have our jobs, we have our life, we're super busy, we want to crash at night. It's so much easier to just do the next dopamine hit on Netflix. That's so much easier than saying, I'm going to listen to a podcast. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to look up every verse in the Bible on humility now or, or the tongue and speech. And I, I do think sometimes we, we, we want an answer, and yet, honestly, I are, are we giving 100% of our effort to change and grow and be the best we can be? Because we've got smart, educated people who can handle complex organizations. I know they could figure out how to be gentle. I know they could figure out how to confront in a, a way that doesn't damage and destroy. So part of it, I think there's some, just some soul searching of... Um, and going to counseling is part of it. So I think whenever yeah. someone wants to meet with me, that's awesome. I always be that. That's great. It's a step. But I... yeah, and it is sort of addictive in its own way when it starts to go right. Hmm. You know, the the I'll never forget the day when I realized, hey, if I just own my part in this and really embrace that, I am so capable of doing that wrong or being selfish or rude or whatever, disrespectful or whatever. Of course I am. I'm a human being. Of course I'm capable of all those things. And the day I realized that's okay and, and my, that's so disarming and I can build bridges with that and it, it's just being humble. It's not saying I'm worthless because I've got some flaws. Of course I have flaws. That changed everything for me. I was so much more able to learn and communicate, and things went so much better at that point. I was able to be curious because I didn't have to defend, 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 defend. No, you must understand. You must understand. No, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My job is to show up as Christ-like as possible for us to have a good conversation, to be constructive and productive and fruitful, yeah. and go from there. That's so good. I think one of, your, one of the great takeaways from you tonight was when somebody is accusing you of being defensive to say, I'm certainly capable of that. And so help me see how I'm doing it right now so that I can communicate differently. That mm -hmm. was huge. And then just your opening remarks about who do I want to be in this conversation and what do I want to bring into this conversation and, and that it takes time. And, but humility plus time plus new effort, it, things change. Mm -hmm. So uh, just in closing, uh, I want to let you all know that we've only done a few of these, and so we're trying to figure out the best way to do this. And if any of you um, have feedback for me, like of how the, these nights could be better, I'm open to that. Uh, I like the idea of like me asking her questions, but if we think two hours of just asking her questions from everybody would be better, I'm open to that. So I'm I'm still feeling my way through how we do this. So what we really want, I don't want to waste anyone's time. I don't want anybody thinking, you know, how long is this going to go? Um, and so if you have feedback for me, I, I would welcome it. Um, and do you have any final thoughts or words? Or I think so. Any yeah. final burning questions before we go? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just playing. <laughs> Hey, uh, why don't they teach this at a, like starting at an elementary level, teaching communications, proper communication like this, so we don't get into these adult situations that become just yeah. Balls? Yeah, I think I mean educators in the room can probably answer that better than I can. I think it's starting to now show up, especially in the special ed um, programs. They're trying to really help those children who really have trouble with emotional regulation, talk about how they feel and why they feel and what's the backstory to it. And they're doing amazing things with that. So yeah, yeah I, I, wish, I wish that were the case, but it's just never too late to learn. That's the good, that's the good news. Okay, so let me just end with one theological thought and then I'll, I'll pray and let us go. It's really interesting in scripture that Jesus is called the word that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And 
uh, in the beginning of Scripture, in Genesis, God is creating with the spoken word. And in Hebrews 11, it says that the world was formed by the word of God. Words create worlds. And there's something about the way we leverage our words that can actually release Christ-likeness into a situation. And so even if, even if all we're remembering from tonight is, I just wanna, I want to be more like Jesus when I step into this conversation, that's gold. And, and the words that we speak can, can build up, they can cut down, they can release Christ's nature into a situation. And uh, he, I mean, he is forever called the word. And so communication is a powerfully spiritual medium. Your emotions, your essence gets communicated through words and communication. And, you know, theologians often debate over, well, what is the image of God? What, what is it in us that makes us different from animals or lesser created, you know, lesser you know, organisms? What, what's unique about humans? And you, you don't, I mean, all I mean, creatures communicate, but, but there's something about this, about this level of communicating and and um, word and essence that's, that's really huge. And so, so let's grow in it and let's do better. And one thing I tell our staff often is, you, um, and I tell new people to the church, is we, no church is ever perfect, but we're doing our best to be clean. We might not handle everything right, but we're, we're gonna be clean in how we handle it. And in the very few things can we control, but we can control the way we communicate and we can control what we bring into the conversation. And to the degree that, rela that relationships and communication is clean, a culture will be clean, and the whole place will have that feeling. And then that's safe, and that's healing. So Jesus, that's what we want to be. We want it here at Hope. We want it in our, our relationships. We want it at our jobs. Lord, as much as it depends on us, and we know a lot of it doesn't, but as much as it depends on us, help us to communicate, um, help us to bring life into our relationships. And, so, and Lord, anybody here who really does feel stuck and who really does feel like they're trying to rebuild or they're, they're hitting up against that brick wall, Holy Spirit, we're not alone. So speak to us, give us insight, give us keys and wisdom. And and I pray you would unlock the hearts of our children and our estranged sister or our, our relatives that we haven't been communicating with. Unlock people's hearts and, and open doors and restore love and restore relationship and bring healing and, and teach us how to model the living word of Jesus in our relationships. God, thank you for Carol. Thank you for Neil and their, their life of service and ministry. Bless them, refresh them. And God, we love you. Jesus' name, amen. Okay, good night.